You've been able to be part of Skate Mass and the development of what's happening spiritually in Skate Mass. And uh, recently, I and Richard have stuck up a real friendship and we've enjoyed each other's company and uh, we keep each other on each other's, on, on our toes. Um, but to have him come and speak here and to give us a message it is something I think that builds bridges across all the churches. And so I wonder, let's give Raish a real storehouse welcome as we invite him up. Thank you, Raish. Well, um, <clears throat> thank you, Dave, very, very much for your, uh, your kind invitation to come uh, here to the storehouse. And uh, I do bring you the warm greetings and welcome from St. Paul's Baptist Church in Skegness to the fellowship here. Um, as Dave has just uh, alluded to over recent months, uh, myself and Richard and Dave have met together for coffee uh, in a local coffee house for fellowship and for encouragement, for laughter. And uh, I do believe that through this there will be greater church unity in Skegness and hopefully, God willing, we will be able to reach out as fellowships together to reach Skegness, uh, which is on our hearts. <clears throat> There's just one slight problem, Dave. Um, I, I mention it because, well, from my point of view, um, well, you've all seen Richard here uh, uh, in his wonderful white flowing robes, resplendent, you might say. And last Monday, when Dave joined us at the cafe, uh, he was wearing his dog collar, which he called his ring of confidence. <laughs> and I, I just felt, really, as the Baptist minister, I felt a bit underdressed by comparison. In fact, this is how I feel. Johnny, please, the first picture. put myself as the Baptist in the shorts. <laughs> but actually, if you look at it, it looks a bit like Dave, don't you think? <laughs> in the summertime. <laughs> so all I'm saying is, this is the best that I can do. Yeah. All right, this is, this is the best that Baptist can do. <laughs> <clears throat> but now, uh, let's, uh, let's just come to scripture. The first scripture from Acts was read. Uh, beautifully during the, the music, and uh, let me just uh, do this, the second part of the reading from Acts chapter 2, um, and I'm taking it up at verse 22, and I shall be reading through to verse 41. If you do have a Bible in front of you, or the Bible on your phone, that would be useful, because I will be referring to it in just a few moments. <coughs> Men of Israel. Listen to this, Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put into death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. And David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices, and my body also will live in hope, because you will not abandon me to the grave nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life, and you will fill me with joy in your presence. It's wonderful words, aren't they? Brothers, Peter says, I can tell you confidently that this patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. 
and seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of Christ. That he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay, as we've been singing. God has raised this Jesus to life. And we are all witnesses of the fact, exhorted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this, God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when the people heard this, Try to imagine this in your hearts. When the people heard this accusation, they were cut to the heart and they said to Peter and to the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off for all whom the Lord our God will call. And with, any, and with many other words he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Hallelujah. What a wonderful passage. What a wonderful passage. Now, we've just read in Acts about Peter preaching. And that's the title of what I want to uh, speak to you this morning, Peter preaching. And he is declaring good news. And it's great preaching. When you look at verse 21, it's great preaching. Because he says, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's great preaching, isn't it? That's wonderful preaching. And uh, sadly, there's not a lot of good preaching these days. Not a lot of good preaching heard from pulpits these days. There are people who preach, but they don't preach the Bible. They don't preach the truth. We had a couple at our church, <coughs> visitors from Birmingham, and they said that someone came supplied to their pulpit, and he said during the sermon, well, I, I don't believe in the Trinity. They weren't going to invite him back. But I mean, that's appalling. That's appalling. We've just been declaring the truth. But there are others that preach, and it's so dry and boring. I'm sure it doesn't happen here, David. But, you know, it, it just, it's just so little feeling, you know, that what I'm telling you is exciting. And so it becomes uninteresting, and it irrelevant to ordinary everyday life. For the ordinary people that just want to know, how can I be sure of my faith? How does the Bible apply to my everyday life, to my job, to the situations I find myself in, to my family situation, to my anxieties about life? Thank God this church fellowship here, I know, preaches faithfully, truthfully, and biblically. And you want to apply the Bible to the challenges that face you as a congregation. And the Bible challenges you and me, and it confronts us. Sometimes it's hard what the Bible says. I pray that the storehouse is not just known for its magnificent music group, which is wonderful, or its wonderful auditorium. May you be known for your faithful good preaching, that Jesus Christ is central. May you be known for that. May, when they talk about the storehouse, they say, oh yeah, that's where you get challenged. And that's where people love each other, because they are a sound group. Let this not be a church that avoids the tricky passages of the Bible. You know, the bits that are difficult. 
I know you don't. Try to expound the whole Bible because it's an amazing book. And I do believe, you know, friends, if we're going to grow together in spiritual maturity, our church, Richard's church, this church, and other churches in town, then we need to be discerning and we need to be wise and to know what is good spiritual food. And one crucial area is, what is good preaching? As a congregation, are you able to discern and understand Sunday by Sunday? Is this good preaching? You can't just accept uncritically whatever any man or woman says here. You've got to have your spiritual wisdom and discernment on. Is this biblical preaching I'm listening to? Is this what I should expect? But can I say this? We're not entitled to expect George Whitfield or Martin Lloyd-Jones or C.H. Spurgeon, the great speakers of the past, the great pulpit masters. You see, this is one of the dangers of the internet. The internet's a wonderful tool can be a real blessing to us. You can listen to the internet and great preachers in the comfort of your own home. You can listen to them while you're doing the ironing. That's not me, actually. I just, I'll just be honest. My wife's here. That's not me, okay? But you can do that. <clears throat> and when you listen to quality preachers on the internet, you think, ah, this is high-quality preaching. That's how it should be at my church. Do you see the danger? Do you see the danger? You can listen to quality preaching on the internet and then you can become discontented with the local provision that God has made here. What I'm saying is this. Be careful. God has placed you here to support the ministry team. And I say this to my fellowship as well. Support us in prayer. There are very few great pulpit masters. They are very few. And it's unfair to expect stuff that you hear on the internet. Look to see what God's saying to you here and pray for your ministry team. But there is a basic minimum we should expect from what we hear. As a Christ-centered church, you should say, the people that come and preach here what should we expect? What do you expect this morning? Well, let's look at Peter's. Let's look at Peter's sermon at Pentecost. Because the Holy Spirit inspired his preaching. So if we look at it, it's going to tell us something, isn't it? Well, the sermon was preached by a man who we are told in verse 4, chapter 2, was filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the first thing. And... If you look at verse 41 of chapter 2, it was astoundingly effective because it was fruitful. 3,000 people were saved. Picture that in your mind. So when we're looking at this sermon of Peter's, if we're ever going to see good biblical preaching, we're going to find it here. Okay? So what are the marks of good? Well, if you read when we read it in two parts, this, this bit, haven't we, his sermon, it takes about two or three minutes. Now, I think Peter preached longer than that. I think this was just the highlights. My first observation is this, my first point. Preaching should be relevant. Yeah. It should be relevant. If people are listening to the sermon and they're saying, what on earth has this got to do with me? Is that good? Biblical preaching? C.H. Spurgeon writes, their attention must be gained or nothing can be done with them. If people are not listening to you, your sermon is not going to do them any good. People have to want to listen. So are you listening? <laughs> and Spurgeon goes on to say this, he says, I never heard of a person going to sleep while a will was being read out in which he expected a legacy. 
No one is going to sleep if you think there's something here which is very valuable and I need to hear what it is. Yeah. That's the attitude we should come from. Yeah. We are told this is the era of the short attention span. When I went to a church not too far from here, one of the first things I did is I walked into this church, someone came up to me, it wasn't Richard, and he says, she says, 10 minutes. 10 minutes is about what we can cope with. I thought, oh, you don't know me. <laughs> but you know, it's not fair to say just 10 minutes because that, I think, actually depends on the congregation. Because if you've got a healthy congregation, spiritually healthy, who are saying, speak to me, I'm hungry. Teach me. Then they may allow you more than 10 minutes. I won't go on for too long, I promise, but I'm just saying, it's about the health of the congregation, not just the 10 minutes finish. Uh, by the way, Richard's congregation is getting used to some real good preaching. Richard is teaching them really well, and they're, they're getting more than 10 minutes. So, so Richard's doing a good job there, praise God. I believe that people here in the storehouse are interested to hear God's word expounded. I do believe that. I know that. You're saying there is something here which is very valuable and I need to hear it. Yeah. Notice how Peter starts. Look at verse 15. He starts brilliantly. He gets their attention. He says, well, he says, we're not drunk. That's a good start, isn't it? <laughs> what? <laughs> their attention. Immediately everybody's thinking, whoa, what's he going to say now? They're all ears because that was the very point that was on their minds because they'd just been watching people acting in a very strange way. The Holy Spirit had come in a powerful way on their lives. They were speaking in tongues. What is going on? It's nine o'clock in the morning. Are they drunk? So he's answering the question on their minds, which is what is going on here? He has their attention. This is not drunkenness. This is the gift of God. This is the promise promised gift of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's saying to the crowd, you lot, this is relevant to you. What you've been thinking and wondering about, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to show you and explain. And that's what a preacher should be doing. As a, as a Christian over the years, I've listened to some very dull sermons. <laughs> sermons that I couldn't apply to my everyday working life. I'm going to be honest here. There were times, years ago, listened to sermons and I thought, I can't bring any of my friends here. And that saddened my heart. Yeah. Preaching must be relevant to people's lives. Amen. Not dull and remote. People need to go away and say, that has spoken to me. I want to bring my friends. I want to bring my family. I want to bring the people that I care about because... This is living, this is living truth. And that's how it should be. Something useful and something challenging. And I pray that God will continue to raise up faithful preachers who will continue to continue the work that's been started here. There's such a good work here. May you have a long line of good preachers. May young people be drawn up and say, I want to fan into flame the gift that God has given me. I have something that these people need to hear. Something that matters. That's how it should be. May that be true across our pulpits in Skegness. So we're not asking for great pulpit masters, but we're asking for sincere preachers who really care about the congregation. And the congregation know if the preacher cares. You can preach the best sermon in the world, but if your heart's not in it, people will discern that. So that's my first point. My second point, briefly, is the sermon should be Christ-centered. Relevant and Christ-centered. Now you may say, Rich, come on, that's obvious, we're in church. But you may be surprised how many sermons in churches around this country 
are not Christ-centered. Some are just moral sermons, you know. You could hear the same sort of sermon preached at a synagogue or a mosque. But if you preached a sermon, a true sermon, at a place like that, people should start to say, hey, 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 just a minute. Hey, I'm not happy about this sermon. There's too much of Jesus in it. Our sermons should have Jesus in them. And some people get offended, even in churches. I've known people leave churches because there's far too much of Jesus in it. But look at verse 22 of chapter 2 of Acts. See how Peter starts his sermon. He says, Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth. See how he starts? Jesus is focused. Then look at verse 36. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus. Do you see? Start and finish. Jesus is the center of Peter's message. And that's absolutely what we should hold to. And we must remember that Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. And we shouldn't be ashamed of it. Never be ashamed of it. There are, 13, uh, there are 26 verses in this passage, and 13 of them make specific reference to Jesus in one form or another. And the other thing is this, which is very important. Peter talks of Jesus as a real historical figure. You know, he's not, he's not talking about Jesus in a vague, spiritual sort of way, you know, a sort of ethereal, wishy-washy Jesus. He's not saying Jesus is just a, a good person to follow his example. We were talking about this at Alpha recently. The historicity of Jesus, the fact that he lived and he walked, he was flesh, he performed miracles, he healed the sick, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he was killed, he was nailed to a real cross. And then verse 32 of chapter 2, just look at that. And God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are witnesses to the fact. Peter is saying, he was buried in a tomb. And we have been witnesses that he is alive. See, Peter is saying to the crowd, and we should be saying in our sermons, this Jesus is real. He walked in history, real time, real events. And this is so, so important. We must, we must have Jesus who he says he is. I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. A few years ago, we had 60 pupils from the Richmond County Primary School come to our Baptist church during midweek and um, to just see what a Baptist church was like. And the, the minister there at the time was Alan Priest, and he asked a question to the group. He said, how many of you go to church? And he was shocked, because not one of those 60 pupils went to church, and none of their parents went to church either. That's in Skegness. Friends, we are living in a generation who know little or nothing of Jesus Christ. So, we have the greatest story to tell. And tomorrow, we are going into the Richmond Primary School, and we are going to do the storytellers, open the book, and tell 400 children about the story of Daniel. And that some of them may never have heard that story before. But you know, it's the real, it's the real Bible. And it's, it's the real Lord Jesus. That's good. Can I just pray? Lord, may this church and other churches in Skegness be filled with people, men and women and children, hungry to know this Jesus. And I pray, Lord, that they will want to tell other people with all their hearts, mind and strength. Amen. Amen. Do you want powerful, effective, life-changing preaching from this pulpit? That's a question. Yes. Good. Well then pray and support your minister and your team and your younger preachers. It is really important. You can have the best music, you can have the best auditorium, you can be the, on the map. But if the preaching goes to the side, I'm not saying it is, I'm just saying if the preaching goes to the side, if there's less 
of the centrality of Jesus, then this church, our church, Richard's church, any other church, will lose its great purpose. So, I've talked about relevance, the centrality, and thirdly, and briefly, Jesus, Peter's preaching is biblical. Because Peter was an eyewitness to the life of Jesus, but that's not enough. It's not enough to have testimony and say, oh, God has done this for me or that for me. Testimony is good, but what Peter does, if you look at verse 16 and 17, is he says, look, let's look at the Old Testament. Joel is talking about exactly what happened here. You see what he's doing? Then a little bit later he refers to the Psalm 16. In verse 27 of Acts 2, he refers to Psalm 16. He says Jesus you know, was not abandoned to the grave. His body did not see decay. What Peter is doing is he's saying to his crowd, it's not just my testimony what I saw on the Mount of Transfiguration. It's what the scripture has foretold. And that is so, so important. He's saying what's happening to you now, this pouring out of the Holy Spirit, was already foretold. Now these are the marks of good preaching. Because what you're doing is you're not just saying it's my testimony. You're saying understand the authority of God's word because it is reliable. And when God says something, he will bring it to pass. And then your hearers will go home and they will say, the way the preacher preached really brought home to me that this Bible is true. And God's word in the Old Testament marries up with the New Testament. And I feel a real, I want to go and read Acts. I want to go and study my Bible. Not just because the minister says I should, but because he's explained to me that the Bible holds together. He's made me use my brain. And I want to go home and my faith in Jesus is stronger. This is how you're able to deal with the anxieties and difficulties of life. And the trials and tribulations is because scripture is utterly reliable. My last point is this. Relevant, Christ-centered, biblical. But fourthly, Peter's preaching is doctrinal. Look at verse 21. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Peter is saying, this Jesus is none other than Jehovah God in the flesh. That's what he's saying. He's saying the God of the Old Testament was in Christ, saving us. He's saying that the God of the highest who dwelt in light put aside his robe of light and took on flesh and descended and condescended to come down. This God is not remote and distant. And you know, never in our wildest imaginings could we think of a God like that. And Peter's saying that's exactly what's happened. And the Holy Spirit is God's Spirit coming into you. And anybody who calls on his name will be saved. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! This is great, great preaching that Peter is doing here. This is our God, the supreme being, who can be found on the pages of the Old Testament and the New Testament. And he has given two important doctrines, the deity of the Lord Jesus and the sovereignty of predestination. This is biblical preaching. Let people go home with great truths in the Bible. And that's why I would say, do not neglect to meet together, as is the habit of some. Friends, we should be encouraging each other. Come and feed. This is the place to feed. This is the place to grow. Let's not neglect to meet together. I say this to my church. So, Peter, and this is important, was not afraid of his audience. Ministers that rely upon a congregation to pay, you know, for their, and quite rightly so, to pay their wage, that's a biblical principle, and it's good. But I 
wonder how many ministers sometimes dodge certain passages, avoid certain conflicting areas, because they know that if they upset certain people, they might shift and not bring money to support the ministry. I am absolutely sure it doesn't happen here, but it does happen in some churches. The minister, the preacher, should not be afraid to say the truth, whatever it costs him or her. Look at Peter. He was not afraid of his audience. And we shouldn't be afraid. Peter in Acts chapter 4 spoke boldly before the 70 members of the Sanhedrin. And Johnny, I wonder if you could go to number 3 picture, please. No, sorry, number 2. I'm sorry I was wrong there. This is a picture of Peter before the Sanhedrin. Now the Sanhedrin, which many of you will doubtless know, were about 70 or 71 members of the high priestly Jewish Sanhedrin. Peter hasn't been to university, hasn't even got his A-levels. He's a former fisherman. He's not known to be a great speaker, but he is preaching boldly. And you see the semicircle there? It's very intimidating, the Sanhedrin. They were like a semicircle, and a person stood in the center, and uh, they were intimidating. That's the equivalent of Oxford and Cambridge standing around you, all the dons saying, now, you unlearned. But what is preaching? What is Peter doing? He's preaching boldly. What does he say in Acts chapter 4, verse 10? Just look at it with me for a moment. He says this. This is before the Sanhedrin. Then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the na name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. I mean, he's really, really bold. Uh, and the thing is that the Sanhedrin were not expecting that. But Peter is bold. And he says, you're the one that killed the Messiah. And the hearers would have thought, he's talking to me. He's talking to me. Peter's saying in some dreadful way, I was involved in the crucifixion of Jehovah God. The Messiah. The author of life. And somehow my sin was on that cross. And that should shock you. It shocked them, I'm sure. Their reaction wasn't, wasn't great. But friends, if we're never upset or ruffled by a sermon that's preached in this room, if you never leave this building feeling that God's word has touched you somewhere, and you maybe feel uncomfortable, maybe even painful, then is the preacher doing his or her job? Peter, Acts chapter 2, verse 37, says this. When the people heard this, they were cut to their heart and said to Peter, Brothers, what shall we do? Now Peter, if he'd wanted to, could have turned the screw more and really rammed it home. But that's not what a preacher does. A loving, caring preacher doesn't leave his audience in the lurch. He doesn't want to turn the screw any tighter. With love in his heart and kindness in his face, he tells them the good news, the message of God's marvellous grace. And that is how it should be. Verse 38, Peter says, Repent and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promises for you promises for you and your children and for all who are far off for all whom the Lord God will call and then people say ah oh, there's hope that, that is how it should be and isn't it wonderful that he uses frail, fragile sinful preachers to speak his word brothers and sisters I hope I've encouraged you not just to read your Bibles which I know you do but to discern what good preaching is. And may, so may this place be known as a, a factory that turns out really good preachers that love the Lord God.
God bless you. Lady.